When you think about economics in Zambia, most likely the first thing that will come to your mind is copper. Copper is a relatively inexpensive and plentiful metal. It is a centerpiece of any industrial economy that is emerging or expanding. Most likely the phones that you're using to take selfies right now or take pictures has a number of copper parts in it. In Zambia, copper plays a huge role in the material well-being of the citizens. Of course, our 15 way coins are made of copper, but in a much deeper sense, every time we get a fluctuation in copper prices or a compromise in production, we see a corresponding change in the cost of goods and services. This is because copper is our main export. The Zambia Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative estimates that 76% of the country's exports is copper. Have we ever thought to ourselves that one day copper will be no more? How much time do we have before this seemingly valuable resource eludes us? One German economist, Eric Zimmermann, said, a resource is not, it becomes. A resource is not, it becomes. What if I told you that we have a resource in Zambia, right here, that is being undervalued and underused? Of course, there are a lot of undervalued resources, but at the top of my list is a woman. Research by Aaron Lowen shows that countries with greater empowerment of women bring in significantly higher medals from the Olympics. Another research by the Catalyst Bottom Line shows that in the Fortune 500 companies, those with more women in its boards have significantly higher financial gains. In Zambia, more than 55% of the population is women. How is it then that we don't have the same demographics when it comes to the top jobs, lecturers in institutions of higher learning. Even the students in institutions of higher learning don't follow the same demographics. Members of parliament don't show the same demographics. One of the reasons that we see these gender disparities in distribution is because of gender stereotypes. Let me give you an example. I grew up in a home of girls, well, mostly girls, I have five sisters and one brother. So I never got to experience gender stereotyping because girls were mostly what my parents had. My parents gave us the same opportunities, took us to the same schools, even gave us the same chores and shouted at us the same when we did wrong. <laughs> I thought this was the case for everyone. When I got into high school, everything seemed okay. But after high school, when I had to make career choices, and my extended family had to be involved. I started to see the gender disparities and the gender stereotypes. So my uncles and my aunt and other close relatives started to tell me that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. They started pushing me towards the social sciences and the art subjects, but I told them I really loved science and math. They came up then with a long list of all the people cousins, extended family members, family friends that had attempted a career in science and were either unemployed or they just didn't make it. Almost to say that if they couldn't do it, because mostly the list had mailed, then I stood no chance. I insisted, and the only support I got was from my dad, who didn't believe in gender stereotyping. Today, I'm in my final year of medical school. When I said I would do the sciences, they said, okay, at least pick the easier ones. But I said, no, I'm going to go for the most challenging. When I got to medical school and would be making the ward rounds in the hospital, what happens is that for most times I'll go with a, I'll be in my usual doctor's, okay, doctor looking outfit, which is a white, a white coat with a stethoscope around my neck. And I'll mostly go with a male nurse. 
So the nurse will be in his usual nurse's uniform, sometimes white bottom and white, white bottom and white top, sometimes white on white, white on blue with a blue apron, or just something close to that. When we get to the patient's bed and we start to talk to the patients, regardless of the patient's socioeconomic status or exposure, they will always call me nurse and call him doctor. <laughs> always. I've tried this a number of times. Proving the gender stereotype that women are nurses and men are doctors. This made me so angry at first. Then I said, let me be part of the solution. Let me do something about this. I came together with a like-minded individual. Her name is Faith. And together we started an organization called Copper Rose Zambia. <laughs> Copper Rose because we want the women and girls in Zambia, our own roses, to be valued just as much as copper is to this economy. So what we're doing at Copper Rose is working on matters of sexual and reproductive health and economic empowerment of women. Of all these things, my favorite thematic area is menstrual hygiene management. <laughs> menstruation is such a taboo subject, but I like to say that menstruation is a secret that is in plain sight because half the world is menstruating has menstruated or will menstruate eventually. So I don't know why we're trying to keep it a secret. Improper menstrual hygiene management has the capacity to change the life of someone forever. If you are a woman or a girl in this place, I want you to imagine this. We came here at about 9 a.m. So imagine sitting in that chair from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m with no menstrual protection, and you're on your period, what would that be like? How will it affect your ability to participate? How will it affect your ability to concentrate on what exactly is going on in this place? That right there is exactly what our little sisters go through every time they have to go to school with an excuse for menstrual protection. If you are a man, of course I won't give you the same example. But I would like to think of your daughter, or your sister, or your niece going through menstruation like that because you've never bothered to find out if she has underwear, if she has feminine hygiene products. Maybe you do buy pads, but what if she has no underwear? Does she have painkillers to be able to deal with menstruation, to be able to go to school? According to UNICEF Zambia research, it is estimated that about 81% of the girls in schools have no access to good menstrual protection, which leaves them with no choice but to miss at least three days of school, every single month, every time. At Copper Rose Zambia, we're just a group of young people, but we're working with girls and teaching them about menstruation. So we're starting with little girls who have no idea what menstruation is, because no one is even telling them what it is for starters. And we're working with adolescent girls, distributing disposable sanitary napkins, but also teaching them how to make their own washable sanitary napkin. <laughs> this is a skill that they will learn and they can have for the rest of their lives. For any meaningful empowerment of a woman or a girl, we need to involve the boys as well. So when we go to these schools, we also teach the boys. And it's surprising to see that the boys have no problem with learning how to sew their own sanitary napkins. So this is the girls sewing their own sanitary napkin, and here they're learning how to sew them. And this is what they look like when they're done. But also, we're teaching boys and young men 
that menstruation is, shouldn't be a taboo. It's all around us and we should embrace it. And this is how happy they look after sewing them. <laughs> and just so you know, the boys actually do so better than the girls in most times. <laughs> so at Copperall Zambia, we're very committed to making sure that girls and boys live to their full potential. Because you see, economic empowerment or empowering women is not just about one training or one loan or a five-day training or something like that. It's about the relationships and social structures that affect women's ability to live to their full potential. It's about telling women and girls that they can do science. It's about telling girls that they can be whatever they want and receiving the support that they need from within the home. If you are married, empowerment of your wife could be doing the dishes after dinner so she can study for her test. I come back to Eric Zimmerman. A resource is not, it becomes. We have a huge resource right before our eyes. A sleeping giant that we have chosen to just leave it as it is. But it's up to each and every one of us to, do, to decide to do something. If we look at the last 50 years, we've made tremendous progress in creation of opportunities for women and girls in Zambia. But for us to be able to tap into the resourcefulness of a woman, it is going to have to be a total, complete overhaul of systems and not a gradual descent into gender equality. What we need is each and every one of us to make up our minds. Don't think of it as a fight, but think of it as tapping into the resource that is within your own home to make the lives of your entire household much better. For as long as women are not equal players in technology, in marketing, on boards, in sports, in agriculture, we won't see any meaningful progress and will not be able to change the narrative about Zambia. It's up to each and every one of us to make a difference. And as long as I keep being called nurse, <laughs> you will find me on the front lines, using my knowledge and skills from science to teach about menstrual health, but also being an example to the young women. And you will find me and my team working tirelessly until we cause change, and until each and every one of us is able to tap into the resourcefulness of the women and girls around us. And my personal mission, is to <laughs> my personal goal is to reach out to at least one million women by 2021. Thank you.